Thank you very much. Now we move, dear colleagues, to the second panel, which will look uh, at the transparency and use of scientific studies in the assessment of glyphosate in the United States, and hopefully will provide insight into the so-called Monsanto papers. For this, we have uh, two experts, which I would, uh, whom I will briefly introduce. Kerry Gillam is research director for the NGO US Right to Know and an experienced uh, journalist in the area of food and agriculture. Mrs. Gillam regularly writes news stories about the Monsanto papers and has recently published a book on glyphosate. We also have Professor Dav David Kirkland, an expert in genetic toxicology with more than 30 years of experience. His company, Kirkland Consulting, advises companies on genotoxic and carcinogenic risk of new and existing substances. I will uh, start first with uh, Madam Carrie Gillam for 15 minutes with a presentation. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. As a journalist for some 30 years now, I'm someone who has spent most of my life um, focusing on facts, pursuing the truth. I've spent roughly 20 of those 30 years delving into the dealings of Monsanto. And I can confidently tell you that the story of the company's top-selling chemical, glyphosate, is not one of truth, but one of deceit, carefully calculated and choreographed deceit. There's overwhelming evidence of attempts to deceive and to do so in ways that manipulate the press and attempt to manipulate policymakers like you. In my reporting role at Reuters, and now at U.S. Right to Know, myself and my colleagues have obtained thousands of documents from our U.S. regulatory agencies, the EPA, FDA, and USDA, as well as from U.S. scientists at public universities across the United States and into Canada and elsewhere. These documents show clearly a long history of deception when it comes to presentations of glyphosate matters. In addition to those documents, we now, of course, have the uh, thousands of pages of internal Monsanto documents, known as the Monsanto Papers. These are Monsanto emails, reports, communications, even text messages. And when you put it all together, it makes it pretty clear, beyond any doubt, that the efforts by this company to manipulate policymakers and members of the public on glyphosate has been going on for some time. You've uh, heard these other panelists talk about the science. I'm just here to talk to you about what the documents show in terms of levels of deception. So we know from the documents that Monsanto has ghostwritten research papers that assert glyphosate safety for publication and regulatory review. We know that they have provided alternative assessments for studies that indicate harm to try to convince regulators to discount evidence of safety problems. We know that they've developed a network of European and U.S. scientists to push glyphosate safety messages to regulators while appearing to be independent of industry. We know they've utilized public relations teams to help ghostwrite these articles and blogs that appear on different websites and different publications using the names of scientists who, again, appear to be independent. We know they formed front groups that work to discredit journalists and scientists who publicize safety concerns. We know that they have a very close relationship with EPA, so close that they felt comfortable providing the EPA with talking points after the IR classification for the EPA to use in dealing with the press. We know that they have a close enough relationship with EPA that they successfully pushed the EPA to remove a top epidemiologist from a scientific advisory panel on glyphosate. And we know that they successfully uh, enlisted at least three top EPA officials to block a 2015 glyphosate review that was to be done by another agency, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And we know that Monsanto said internally they were worried that this agency would agree with IARC. So I just want to give you a few key examples. This is um, the Environmental Agency Cancer Assessment Review Committee. And when they put together their report asserting the safety of glyphosate, they cited several key papers. One top on the list, of course, was grime. Internally, you see Monsanto's David Saltmiris saying directly that he ghost wrote that paper. Another cited by the EPA in its review 
is the Williams 2000 study. This, this study has been cited by regulatory agencies and, and uh, in publications um, hundreds of times around the world. You see internally a Monsanto scientist, William Hayden's, talking to his colleagues, making reference to this study as one where they paid other scientists to just edit and sign while Monsanto actually did the work. This is another example. This is a, a paper from 2011 that countered concerns about glyphosate's reproductive effects. The documents show that Monsanto's Donna Farmer talked internally about the work she was doing on this paper, writing and drafting it, doing a cut and paste for the paper to assert there was no evidence linking glyphosate exposure to adverse reproductive or developmental problems. So if you, if you go through a draft of the paper, which I can't put the entire paper up here, you see she did significant work. But you see that when the paper is published, there are no references. Monsanto and Donna Farmer's name have been removed. <laughs> I'm having trouble with my clicker. All right. Another example, this is the uh, 2016, the Intertech examples, a review of glyphosate carcinogenic pot potential published in 2016. You can see when the papers were published, they disclosed the authors were scientists hired by a firm, Intertech, that was paid by Monsanto. But they took pains to declare that no Monsanto employees reviewed any of the manuscripts. But we know, in fact, because we can see in the documents that not only did Monsanto review, they wrote and drafted a good portion of this. This is, this is just one email again here. This is from Hayden's, but you can see that he's talking about what he's done on the work, and then he's trying to decide who potentially should be the author, discussing who, who should be the author, because, of course, it's not clear. Uh, okay. This is another example. Here again, you can see Monsanto's own people describing what they do as ghostwriting. Manuscript to be initiated by Mon as ghostwriters. This would be more powerful if authored by non-Monsanto scientists, and they give a few examples, Kirkland, Keir, Williams, Grime, et cetera. So we know that they talk about this. We know that this is how they refer to it. These are just a few examples. Monsanto has sought to dismiss the concerns, and they've said in their own words, whoops, <laughs> they've said in their own words that this has been taken out of context. Yet the federal judge in the United States who has seen the evidence to date has expressed his own concerns. This is a transcript from a recent hearing in which the judge is, is saying to Monsanto that the evidence shows that Monsanto has been drafting reports for allegedly independent experts. And he questions Monsanto on how they can say that that is irrelevant uh, to evidence about whether or not it causes cancer. Another way in which Monsanto has manipulated regulators and the public is by establishing networks of scientists around the world to support its agenda and its message about the safety of this chemical. Monsanto and or the Monsanto Back Glyphosate Task Force pays them, they lobby regulators, they author papers, essentially to push this message that the chemical is safe. There are many individuals and there are many types of different relationships that we've seen in these documents. You can see here that Professor David Kirkland is one such paid expert Monsanto has relied on. In 2012, Monsanto was very worried about genotoxicity questions arising from glyphosate research. When it engaged Kirkland, Monsanto needed someone to help counter these concerns that were persisting surrounding genotoxicity. They talk about how much he's going to uh, need to be paid. They talk about that he's expensive. But the work was valuable. It was ultimately cited by EPA for this paper. Here in Kirkland paper concludes glyphosate and typical GBFs, glyphosate-based formulations, do not appear to present significant genotoxicity risk. So we don't have time to go through all the examples, but I want to point out there's evidence of much more ghostwriting than just in the research. Monsanto, we see in the documents, also drafts and outlines articles and policy briefs uh, promoting product safety. Monsanto strategies um, are promoted in these ways. Monsanto arranges for friendly scientists to publish under their names, so they appear to be independent, but actually in some cases we see public relation teams writing them or at least drafting these communications. Uh, we see them even editing or outlining presentations that academic professors are delivering uh, to regulators, policymakers, or other audiences without any mention of Monsanto's involvement. So why are these dealings secret? 
Why, why are they trying to hide something? Well, it seems apparent that Monsanto actually fears real, independent, authentic science. Monsanto said itself it feared the IARC review when it found out in 2014. This is before IARC sat down, before the classification. Monsanto says it fears this. It says internally that it, it knew it had vulnerability in epidemiology, toxicology, genotox. Monsanto officials even predicted that glyphosate would warrant a possible or probable rating from IARC, the documents show. Documents also show Monsanto feared the ATSDR, the separate agency that was also looking at glyphosate in 2015. Monsanto officials worked with the high-level EPA officials to get that ATSDR review blocked, though ATSDR now says that it is restarted and we may get some information. But you can see very clearly this quote from Monsanto, we're trying to do everything we can to keep from having a domestic IARC occur. So you recall I mentioned earlier another strategy by Monsanto with regulators is to provide alternative assessments for studies that indicate harm to convince regulators to discount evidence of safety problems. This dates back to at least 1983 and this, this one very important study that Monsanto had done on its behalf. This has been cited over and over again. It's considered a pivotal study for glyphosate. Chronic feeding study of glyphosate, Roundup Technical in Mice, ran for two years from 1980 to 1982, involved 400 mice, involved, uh, administered different doses of the weed killer, or they observed that in a control group that uh, received no glyphosate at all. Um, unfortunately for Monsanto, some of the mice developed tumors at what was considered significant, statistically significant rates, while the control group, the mice that received no glyphosate, showed no tumors at all. The toxicologists within the EPA were very clear about the findings. February 1984 memo, they say that the glyphosate, this, this indicates glyphosate is oncogenic, producing a rare tumor in a dose-related manner. Monsanto immediately discounted the findings, arguing the tumors were unrelated to treatment and false positives were being seen. They tried to convince the EPA to, to discount the tumors. EPA toxicology experts refused to back down initially. Uh, one EPA scientist wrote in February 1985 that, quote, a prudent person would reject the Monsanto assumption that glyphosate dosing has no effect on kidney tumor production. Glyphosate is suspect, this EPA scientist said. Monsanto's argument is unacceptable. There were eight members of the EPA toxicology branch who were very worried about this, and they consigned, signed a consensus review in March 1985 stating glyphosate was a category C oncogen, a substance possibly carcinogenic to humans. Now, that finding didn't sit well with Monsanto, and the company mounted what turned out to be a multi-year campaign to change EPA's mind. They hired a pathologist. Many of you have probably heard this story. The pathologist found an extra tumor in the control group. A lot of questions were raised. EPA brought in a scientific advisory panel scientific advisory panel said that EPA should require Monsanto to redo the study, do it over again. EPA did request that. Monsanto refused to do the study again. Uh, so this dragged on and on and on for, for years, actually, until 1991. By that time, EPA had essentially agreed with Monsanto. The mouse, mouse study findings were dis discounted. Um, and EPA said there was a lack of convincing carcinogenicity evidence in relevant animal studies. Still, some EPA scientists refused to go along and refused to sign the report. So this is just one study, but we know through the documents that Monsanto has done this with other research studies that's presented to regulators. Um, indeed, when the EPA convened a scientific advisory panel in December 2016 to look at glyphosate issues, several of those scientific advisory panel members told the EPA that it was not following its own guidelines. One of the things we've also found is what we refer to as fake fronts, false fronts. Um, there are, as I said earlier, many university scientists who are giving their expert and independent opinions, uh, secretly receiving funding at the same time um, from Monsanto or other entities uh, without disclosing it. Often we find in the documents they're receiving very specific directions on what to say uh, from the companies that have a stake. We have emails where Monsanto or the representatives discuss editing, writing papers, presentations to be delivered by these independent experts. Um, we even have Monsanto officials and PR people discussing in documents we've obtained 
how they can set up organizations that will specifically go after and attack journalists, scientists, and others who raise questions. One group set up as a false front, Academics Review. This is a site that publishes a host of industry propaganda while attacking people who question the industry spin. This is a quote up here, maybe you can't read it, but it's from an internal document in which a Monsanto executive says, from my perspective, the problem is one of expert engagement, and that could be solved by paying experts to provide responses. The key will be keeping Monsanto in the background so as not to harm the credibility of the information. So these tactics are not limited to the U.S. We, they cross continents. You're, they're seen here in Europe as well. I'm running out of time. You're going to hear about that in the next session, I suppose. But uh, it's clear from the documents what's been happening with regulatory influence, false fronts, is happening in Europe as well. You will have seen that one. This is just a uh, quote from Charles Jameson, who was a member of the IARC Working Group, a scientist. He was deposed recently by Monsanto, and he took the opportunity essentially to tell Monsanto's attorneys to stop with the fake news. So these details I've laid out are not in dispute. They're all documented. Monsanto says it has nothing to hide. Uh, but I want you to ask yourself, why would Monsanto need to go to these links? Why would they need to ghostwrite research papers, set up networks of scientists? Why would they be worried about the IARC review and the ATSDR review? This is, these are not the actions of a company that has nothing to hide. This is not how you promote a product this is, that's actually proven safe. This is how you whitewash unfortunate and unprofitable facts. This is not by accident, but by design, and it serves Monsanto very well, but it does not seem that it serves the public interest. Thank you.